Hi, and welcome back to Calorie Lab Online, Science and Secrets. This is class number three, week three. So in the last two weeks, we've been discussing fascia, uh, this connective tissue in the body, which is becoming recognized in Western science as being much more than simply a tissue that joins things together. Recent research has shown that it actually transports light. So much in the same way as a fiber optic cable, light is able to move along through this connective tissue. And this tissue is found between every cell in the body, it seems. The more they look, the more they find it. They've looked in many different organs, they've looked under the skin, they looked in muscle, tendon, ligament, nerve, fibers. And everywhere they look, they find that between the cells, that make up the structure, there is, there is this um, matrix, this collagen matrix, which is surrounding fluid-filled bags. So you have bags of interstitial fluid surrounded by a collagen structure, and then you have a lymphatic drainage network to take away the waste products. So what it seems is this system is allowing communication throughout the whole body. Communication not only of fluid, and of light, but also of tension. And in that way, the body adapts and molds in response to the demands put on it. If we have an injury, the body compensates. We all know that, we all know that we feel that compensation. But what the fascia is showing us, or what this network is showing us, is showing us the pathways that that compensation is likely to follow. So we discussed in the last class how there was a line in the front and a line in the back. By line, what I mean, or, or what Thomas Myers means, who, who created this concept, or who identified, let's say, that this was happening in the body, along with Ida Rolf, of course, and other body workers. What, what they mean by this line is that there is a line of pull or tension. And that's in so much as one set of uh, muscles or tendons joining onto another muscle, joining onto another muscle. In so much as the, the point where they both meet the attachment point onto the bone, in fact, can be separated off. And when you separate off the attachment point, the two tissues which were attached there come off as one. Not only that, whilst they're attached, in fact, by pulling on one, the next one is moved. Just like here when I pull on my trousers, this part of my trousers is moved. In the same way, when you pull on the tibialis anterior, rectus femoris moves. So that's part of the superficial front line. And you have these different lines in the body. We've discussed the back line and the front line, superficial front and back lines, which are put on first of all, well, sorry, last of all, like a, the shallowest uh, muscular line that you come to, which are governing the body in the sagittal plane. And they're working together with the deep front line. And we explain how the deep front line goes all the way from the big toe through the core of the body Iliopsoas taking it back onto the spine, diaphragm bringing it back forward onto the sternum, and then it's traveling up underneath the ribcage through the larynx, pharynx, and eventually to the tongue. And I explained how this line is what is lifting the body up. So we have this uplift in the body coming from the deep front line. We have control going forwards and backwards with the superficial front and the superficial back line. Now the superficial back line is made up of primarily slow twitch muscle fibers. That's because it has to work all day. It has to keep you upright for the 16 hours that you're not sleeping. Let's say you sleep eight hours. So whether you're sitting, kneeling, standing, even to a degree slouching, these muscles are going to activate in the back line to keep you upright. Now all of those muscles are actually working to bring the body into extension, to take you back, to take the spine back. The one exception is actually the hamstring. So the hamstrings are part of this superficial back line, but actually when the hamstrings activate, of course, they are going to flex the knee. Whereas all of the other muscles that you find in that back line are working for extension. Now, the superficial front line is very much the opposite to that with all of the muscles working for flexion, with the exception of the quadriceps or particularly rec fem, which is working in, you know, as the opposite, as the antagonist of the hamstring. So all the muscles in the front line, which are actually fast twitch muscle fibers, allowing you to run or to punch, 
to respond quickly, to survive. These will tire more easily compared to those in the back, keeping you upright. But all of those ones in the front are working for flexion, so bringing the body forwards. And the one exception to that, as I say, is the quadricep. So we have those in the back, slow twitch, all for extension, with the exception of the hamstring. And we have those in the front line, superficial front line, that is, working for flexion, with the exception of rec fem, which is extending the knee. And they are all fast twitch muscle fibers, allowing you to respond quickly. So this is, these three lines work to govern us in the sagittal plane. Now, according to the research uh, of others, uh, it, a lot of problems, and I've experienced this also in my practice uh, as, as a therapist, a lot of people who come to me with musculoskeletal problems in the sagittal plane particularly, I find that the root cause is inappropriate tone or uh, tension, weakness, in, or inhibition in this deep front line. So the deep front line itself stops to work properly. It just simply, for example, if you were to slouch, then this deep front line, which is normally doing this, suddenly disengaged. And as that happens, your superficial front line and your superficial back line take over the role of governing you in that sagittal plane. And of course, they are not designed to do that. So as soon as they start to do that, you go into malfunction, i.e. something gets overactive. This is often what's happening in the back when people are, have pain in the back, then the muscles to extend the back are now having to work very hard because this deep front line is not working. So this pattern of compensation, the same like if you were to sprain your ankle, the pattern of compensation within and between the lines of the fascia is what um, can be uh, a way of understanding how an imbalance moves through the body and therefore can be a way of treating imbalance in the body. Now in Calorie, they didn't have these fascial lines. But some years ago, in fact, I can tell you, it was 2009, so 11 years ago, I went to Kerala and I showed my Gurukal and Sharifka the book of Thomas Myers with all the different lines in. And he was very shocked to see them uh, drawn in this way because for him, the exact same lines were the energetical lines that they had learned or he had learned and that was what was passed down in the tradition of calorie. So they weren't considered to be lines of myofascial continuity, although that's what they are as well. They were considered to be energetical lines, lines of energetical continuity through the body. They were called nadais, just like in Chinese medicine, Chinese traditional medicine, they are called uh, meridians. Now, if you look at the map of the meridians, the map of the nadis, or nadis, and the map of the myofascial lines, you will see an agreement. In fact, around about 70% agreement. Now, that's uh, bearing in mind these two Indian and Chinese systems. These were created many thousands of years ago. That's a fairly good agreement, I think. So, what it seems then, and research again is supporting this. I'll put the references in for this research for you to have a look at if you wish. Research is now saying that this physical, uh, tangible system, this uh, system of connective tissue with its lines of um, least resistance, if you like, lines where the tension goes through the system, this is the physical substrate. It, it appears to our energetical body. The, if, you, if you look at it from a, the, the Ayurvedic approach, we have the different koshas. We have uh, five different koshas. Now, we'll talk about them in detail later on. But the first kosha, Anamaya kosha, is the food body. This is what is uh, everything from the surface of the skin to the lining of the gut. This is what we, what, what would rot of the body, right? Now, this, um, this is your um, food, food sheath. Now, this, of course, is where you find the fascia. In fact, it goes, permeates entirely through that. As it does so, it, it passes light, it passes nutrients, it passes water, and of course, tension. The second, pranamaya kosha, your energetical body, the sheath of prana, or the sheath comprised of prana. What the research is now indicating is that this exists inside this, yeah? The, the, the pranic body 
is living within or moving within, breathing within, within, within this Anamaya Kosha, within the, um, within the connective tissue of the Anamaya Kosha, so within the fascia. Now, the third body, of course, um, is, what is our thoughts, emotions, and memories. Now, research has for some time shown that this, um, this holding on of tension that we have as a result of trauma is again connected into this tissue so into this kind of fascial muscle memory and so certainly what what we what we uh what the evidence is suggesting as it's coming through now is that these koshas are all kind of rooted within the connective tissue rooted within the fascia and in fact neuroscientists some neuroscientists now uh, are exploring the concept or the idea that the consciousness or our consciousness resides not simply in the brain but in the whole connective tissue and as we keep that connective tissue system released and relaxed as we keep it well conditioned we allow the the light to move through the body we allow the body to uh, inhabit space and, and uh, not be confined and not develop disease in the same way like it might do if the body was sedentary and inactive which of course is is not such a big uh, change to what we already accept as, as, as being the truth, right? We know that if we, we don't use our body, we're going to lose it. Uh, what this evidence or what this research is showing is just that there is perhaps this um, interconnectedness in the body. And one thing I said last, last time was uh, how the body is um, self-regulating. And in that sense, um, tension will find its way and balance through the body. Now, of course, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. If I, if I have a surgery or if I injure myself, um, then the damage or the change rather that happens in one area of the body is likely to then pass on an effect elsewhere. Now I can take precautions and control the inflammation and how to reduce that, but ultimately it's likely to pass on. Now this is what we're basically saying is a plasticity. Now this plasticity is happening within the fascia, just like it's happening within the brain. Um, recent science is saying how our brain is a plastic structure that depending on how we think, depending on how we uh, use our brain, it will change and certain emotional responses will become easier for us to have in so much as the impulse required, for example, for me to um, go into anger or to go into empathy or to go into fear or to go into love, the impulse can become much smaller. And that happens as a result of the synapses effectively moving together. The bridge then is much smaller and the, the action potential required to jump that gap is therefore much smaller as well. Now in terms of the myofascia, what happens is in the same way it is a plastic system and it adapts in response to how it is used. Not only is the myofascia plastic, the bones within the myofascia are plastic, they are also adapting in response to how they are used. For example, if we were to take all of the, the femur bones and look at them from a group of people, we would find within that femur, the actual area of density has changed from one to another. And that's to do with how the weight bearing happens, how that goes through the bone. We'll go into that more in the next class. But in terms of the myofascia itself, this system of connective tissue, which is incorporating muscles, ligaments, tendons, as well as this more kind of undifferentiated fascia in the sense of it being like a flat sheet of connective tissue like we have here in the thoracolumbar region or here under the foot. In the case of all of these connective tissues or these uh, contractile tissues rather, the way in which we use them over time will change the way in which they, um, the way in which electricity is moving through them. So for example, if I have an injury in my shoulder and my shoulder is closed down in the front here, the electrical activity in this area will be different to how it will be in this shoulder. Now, if I go in there and change it by corrective exercise, by therapy, I can realign the physical structures and put the electrical flow back to how it should be. But if I don't, if I leave it for too long, the electrical pattern there will become basically like a fixed new pattern. And then in order to go in there and change it, it's going to take a lot more effort. It's still possible, but it will take a lot more effort. So in this sense, our myofascial web is changing, constantly changing. And what you have in calorie is a system to properly condition it, 
to keep it um, to keep it balanced, to keep it uh, appropriately strong, in so much as you have the right amount of strength in the joints to stabilize the joints, as well as in the prime movers. You have the right amount of strength in the synergists, um, as well as the, the larger muscle groups. So you have control of the body, you have um, a greater um, neuromuscular coordination. Okay, so we're going to go more in depth into this in the next class, and we're going to look particularly at the bones and how the bones restructure themselves. Because in the in the Vadivu, just like in yoga as, uh, asana, you have a way of restructuring uh, the bone uh, density. Right. Okay. Um, one last thing. Um, when we make this movement that you've been doing, if any of you are wondering why we go one way, and we go up and down, and we don't go the other way, in the Karivandaram form, when you go down into the elephant. The reason is you're activating the spiral line on one side. So when you see these different myofascial lines, you have, as I say, the three that are governing you in the sagittal plane. But then you have two that wrap around the body. One wraps one way, one wraps the other way. So contracting one will lengthen the other, contracting then this one will lengthen the other, and so on. So they start from behind the ear, they come down, they wrap around the chest, then go down the leg, underneath and back up. If you twist all the way to one side, like this, you will engage the upper half. Yeah, if you stand up and do it, you will engage the whole line. In this low heart exercise that we do, when we look to the elbow behind, you are engaging this spiral line. So when we go this way, in the Kalari Vandanam form, and we go down and into elephant, we're specifically trying to target the line that runs from the left nostril. This, the energy line that runs on this line is Ida, the feminine Nadai. And so what we're doing here is activating the feminine energy in the body, trying to lift up a cooling aspect of that. Okay, I'll leave it there. Hope that's interesting for you. Please get in touch. Let me know if you have any questions or if I've said anything that you didn't really understand. And we can go back over it in the next video or in a couple of videos and I can clarify it for you. Until then, Nalakana, thank you.